welcome to Turn the Page, the official podcast of the Syosset Public Library. This is Jessica with Syosset Library's Turn the Page podcast, and we are very happy to welcome our guest today. Would you like to introduce yourself and tell us about yourself? Hi, Jessica. Thanks for having me on the show today. I've had this very amazing, wonderful career. I came out of MIT back in the 90s, started as a software engineer, and throughout my career, I have built lots of labor marketplaces, ad tech, video marketplaces. I've done cybersecurity, tracked terrorists and criminals on the dark web. I also realized early on I wanted to become a CTO, a chief technology officer, and in doing so, I realized there were a bunch of skills I needed that no one had taught me. Leadership, networking, negotiating, team building. So I had to develop those skills in myself. And as I did so, I realized these skills aren't just for executives, they're for everyone. So I began to upskill my team. And around the same time, MIT wanted to teach these skills to our students. When I heard about it, I reached out, I offered to share my content. And instead, MIT asked me to help create new content with them and then to teach. So in addition to my career doing startups, I've also been teaching at MIT for over 20 years. Again, these skills like leadership, networking, negotiating, and that of course turned into my book, The Career Toolkit, Essential Skills for Success That No One Taught You. Wow, that is quite impressive. So you went there and then you ended up turning that around and teaching it. And I I have to say like the things that you were talking about, um, about leadership and networking. Uh, Yeah, those are sort of those things I feel like people tell you like, oh, you're either born with it or you're not. But I I don't know if I really agree with that um, myself. Uh, And clearly you don't because this is part of what you learn to teach. Let's dispel that myth. It is true. Some people are born with it, just like some people are born with a proclivity to doing math or for picking up languages or playing a certain sport. But that doesn't mean those of us who don't have it can't learn those. And in fact, the people who have that natural talent and just say, well, I don't have to work at, I just do it, can be eclipsed by those of us who say, okay, I need to work at this each and every day, I wanna get better. And in fact, I was not natural at any of these things. I think what really helped, the fact that I wasn't natural, I had to really work hard, I had to understand it, And by putting in that extra work, it helped me really understand how to break down these skills and understand their components so I can better teach it to other people. So let's jump right in to the Career Toolkit, uh, which is your book. Please talk a little bit about it. It has 10 chapters, and these are the skills that companies want. Not just, well, Mark thinks they want this. Surveys done by MIT and other universities have consistently picked up these skills, not just for recent college grads, not just for engineers, but for everybody in all fields at all levels. So the skills the 10 chapters, they're in three sections. Section one, careers, how to create and execute a career plan. Chapter two, working effectively, things like managing your manager, understanding corporate culture. Chapter three is interviewing not from the candidate side, there's plenty of things out there, how do you answer this interview question, but from the hiring manager side, because so many of us actually have to hire people once we're in a job, and yet we don't teach people how to do that. The second section, leadership and management, chapter on leadership, one on the people side of management and one on the process side of management. And again, these skills are not just for people with certain titles, they are for everyone. Even your first day on the job as a junior person, you have to lead and manage other people, just not through formal authority. And then the third section, interpersonal dynamics, communication, networking, negotiating, and ethics. First of all, I I was writing down a bunch of those things, and that sounds incredible. Uh, You make a very, very good point about hiring. There's so much out there about how to conduct yourself in an interview. And you're right. A lot of us, um, even those of us who have to teach ourselves how to network and all of these skills, when we get to that point, 
where now you have to start building your team. It, it's, it's like you're looking through your window of an office and you're seeing what's going on around you, but you're not exactly sure how to pick up the nuances of what's happening. Uh, exactly. Yeah. And I, I speak to that in the chapter. The, the analogy I like to use when explaining this, imagine if you said to a 16-year-old kid, okay, you're old enough to drive, and you've been in the car before. You get how the steering wheel works, and you've seen this. So here are the keys. Best of luck to you. I think you got this. That would be insanity. And yet, what do we do when we hire people? Say, okay, well, welcome to my team. Listen, now that you're part of the team, we have a new candidate. You've been interviewed before, right? You've seen how this works. So best of luck to you. Let's cross our fingers and hope it works. And that doesn't. And yet we do it. And I like also you talk about, you said managing your manager. So should managers be afraid of people who have <laughs> read your book and that they will be managed? Not at all. And in fact, these skills make things better. I mean, I sidestep it for a moment, I'll come back to it, because often people think, wait, if my employees learn to negotiate better, won't that mean they're going to get more money at their raises? Yeah, it might, but it also means they're going to negotiate better in everything else they do when they're working with their customers and suppliers, when they negotiate with each other. They're going to do better and come up with better solutions. That's going to help everyone. I'll gladly pay them more money for that. So managing your manager, it's not about, well, I'm in charge now. It's not about authority or control. It's about how we relate and connect. And it has to do with understanding your manager's style and matching that style to be more effective in how you engage. In fact, it applies not just to your manager, but to everyone you interact with at the company. That's so fabulous. And I know I just picked up on two of the things um, in the chapters uh, if you were to pick a third chapter specifically that you think is, I mean, they're obviously all valuable, but um, surprisingly more than what someone might expect, uh, what would you pick? I wouldn't pick any particular chapter, but I'm going to give an analogy to help people understand the power of learning these skills. And we're going to use negotiations as the example. Suppose you're 25 years old and you have a job offer for $50,000. But instead of taking it, you've learned to negotiate. Maybe you read my book, maybe a different book. Say, okay, before I take this job, I'm gonna call you up. We spend five minutes negotiating and I get 51,000, just $1,000 more. We can imagine that could be doable. If you do nothing else, if you stay in this very single job for the rest of your career, the next 40 years, that five minutes worth of negotiating just got you $1,000 more for 40 years. You just earned $40,000. But of course, you're not going to stay in this job for 40 years. You'll have raises, promotions, other jobs. If you learn to negotiate, you can add tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of dollars to your lifetime earning. And when you think about it this way, you say, oh my God, why have I not learned to negotiate? I got to do this today. It works whether you're 25 or 35 or 45, even 55. Now, here's the bigger secret. We can do the math with negotiating. $1,000, 40 years, I get. The same applies to each of the skills in the book. Now, no one's going to say, oh, you're a slightly better networker. Here's $1,000 more. But by being a slightly better networker, you'll have access to more opportunities. You'll stand out more. You'll get more information through your network it will lead you to more success. Being a better leader, a better communicator, same thing. No one just hands you more money, but you stand out, you get promoted faster, you get more opportunities. All of these skills, it's not about being the best in the world. It's about getting just a little bit better and you're going to get this massive return on investment that will have a huge impact on your overall success. So moving forward, uh, there is an app that you have developed? I created an app for the book. And looking back, it's surprising this hasn't been done sooner. I was chatting with my neighbor one day and she said, oh, you should build an app for your book. Okay, great. What should the app do? I don't know, but build an app. Great. Okay, that's not very helpful. And I thought about what could this app do? Now, lots of people just take a PDF of their book and wrap in an app and there's no point doing that anymore. Now you can just get on a Kindle. So that's not valuable. I'm fortunate to have a background in teaching 
in technology, in media, I started thinking about what are the things I've seen and what are ideas. One thing we know is spaced repetition works. That's a fancy name for when you read a chapter in school, look at it again before the test to remind yourself and look at it two or three times. Flashcards are a common way to do this. So what could we do? Now, flashcard apps exist, but no one wants to have to go and open an app every day. I know readers won't do that. So I came up with the following idea. Imagine if you went through my book with a highlighter, here are the key points. Those are the tips. I put the tips into the app. Now you can use the app one of two ways. You don't even have to open it. You just set a time of day that's convenient for you and it will pop up as a notification on your phone, one of the tips. It's like a daily affirmation, but with useful content to go, oh, right, that's a good reminder. Swipe it away. It takes you two seconds. You don't even have to open the app. That's going to help you better retain what you're reading. Or you can say, oh, I'm about to walk into a networking event, an interview, something where I need to be reminded of the content, open the app, pull up that section, go through the tips and get reminded. I really thought this app must exist. I'll just go license it from someone. It did not. So I filed a patent on that technology of taking the content and delivering it through a push notification. We built the early version of the app. It's available from my website. I linked to the Android and iPhone stores completely free, the Career Toolkit app. But then we're also putting out a universal version. Think of it like a Kindle version where other authors, podcasters, and other people can put their content on. So folks can download the Brain Bump app which will be available starting in April, 2022. When they download the Brain Bump app, they can then select the content as a companion to the book or to check out the book before they buy it and better retain that knowledge as well. So just talking about the app then, so the where can people find it again? I'm going to make sure that uh, this information is available in the show notes, but um, for those who are listening and might not be able to access that right now. You can find the Career Toolkit app on the Android and Apple stores, but if you go to my website, thecareertoolkitbook.com, and you go to the app page, thecareertoolkitbook.com slash app, A-P-P, or just click the app up top, that will have links to where you can find it in the Android and iPhone store and is completely free. That is so cool. And what was, so I have to ask then, I mean, what is the benefit to you of giving this away for free? You know, I think it's awesome. But when you, uh, when you talk about all of the work that went into this, um, you know, what is your personal return of investment? When I first built it, my personal return was helping people. I have always said from the start, I am less worried about trying to make lots of money with the book. No one makes money off their books. I'm more concerned about helping people with their professional efficacy. That has been a passion of mine in my volunteer work, in my teaching, and a lot of things I do. I just want to get this out. There might be someone in the world who says, I don't want to pay 20 some dollars for the book. I'd rather just get those tips for free. And if that's what you prefer, please do it. I am happy for you to have it and be successful and use that. But I do believe that it will help drive people to either say, let me check this out. Oh, this is useful. Okay, I'm going to get the book. I want to get a little deeper into it. Or it's also going to help authors. Of course, we all like word of mouth marketing. What are you more likely to talk to your friends about? That book you read six months ago and forgot two weeks later, or the book you're reminded of every single day when it pops up. So I think there is some benefit for authors like myself, but really I designed it thinking, how can we help readers? So another question I have, and I want to kind of... Uh, move towards because um, when we were chatting before we started recording, we talked a little bit about um, just different programming and how to help upscale um, uh, businesses and people. Um, but I did uh, want to ask a little bit, um, if you don't mind, about nonprofits, especially myself being um, in a library and, you know, things are 
maybe a little bit different in how we're able to do things or um, just the type of communication. Um, could you talk a little bit about how the lessons in your book and your app do apply to people working at a nonprofit? Great question. And I've certainly been involved with a number of nonprofits. These days, I serve on the board of two of them. But these skills are really universal skills. They are not just for for profits. They're not just for the office. In fact, these skills apply in our schools, in our social activities, some of them even in our relationships with our friends and family, the communication skills, how to recognize people's communication styles, that's going to help you anytime you communicate. So really, you can think of these skills as fundamental skills for how we engage with others. Those skills at the end, the interpersonal dynamics, useful always. Your career plan applies, whether you're at a nonprofit or a for-profit or go back and forth between the two. Leadership is something that you do each and every day, no matter what type of organization, even if it's just a casual group of people. So really look at these skills as fundamental skills that can apply in all different facets of your life. And getting back to what we were just talking about before, um, how, so talk a little bit about the, um, the programming and the ups, uh, how to help upscale um, businesses. I mentioned earlier, the book wasn't for me to make money, it's for helping people. And that doesn't just stop with the book. I have a number of great resources on the website. So the careertoolkitbook.com slash resources. I link to a number of resources. Now I link to other books that people might find useful if they want to go further in these topics. I link to free online resources so people can explore things in more depth. I also have a number of free downloads, including questions to help you with your career plan, questions to ask during an interview. But one of them is how to create a development program at your organization. It was written for companies, but it can be used by individuals, can be used by organizations like libraries. Here's the thing. The best way to learn these skills, it's not simply by reading a book. We spoke earlier about how some people are natural, but many of us have to actually learn and practice. Think of it like sports. And I use sports because it's different than what we normally learn. When we're learning English in school or math, we're just memorizing rules, memorizing formulas, writing them down and putting them back on a test. That's not how you learn to play a sport or an instrument. You actually have to practice. No one can tell you just by lecturing to you. Say, okay, now you know how to play the cello. You have to go and practice. So when we think about how we do sports, well, we run drills, we do scrimmage, we practice and engage. We might even watch the tape, look at how we're doing and change things. That's what we want to do when we learn these skills. So the best way to learn is to create a peer learning group. I recommend groups of about six to eight people, but you can scale it up into a larger group. And I talk about how you come together and think of it like a reading group. You engage with some content. Now, yes, you can use my book and I have a description how you can break down my book into sections and use them for particular goals. But if you don't want to use my book, use a different book. There are many great books at your local library. You can also use an article or a video online. You can use a great podcast like this one. And so you get that content, you listen to the episode, or you read a few pages, and then you discuss it. Now, here's the key. If we're talking about leadership, We'll read something about leadership. And as we talk about, it, you're going to pick up something that I missed or have an experience I didn't. And I'm going to learn something from that. These are multidimensional concepts. They're not just memorize this one thing. So it's that discussion where we really learn. And then in fact, I might say, you know, I have this leadership challenge. I'm trying to think what I should do. We're well, going to say, well, hey, Mark, what about this? And that's your chance to practice, to scrimmage, to think about a real problem. Someone else may say, hey, I had a similar situation. Here's what I did. Here's what worked. Here's what didn't work. And that's like watching the tape. We can learn from others. Or we might even say, let's do a drill where you do, for example, a case study that you can get from business schools or other online resources. And we do a leadership simulation or we do a negotiation simulation. And in doing that, we actually can practice. 
I like the idea of, first of all, um, the peer learning groups. I think you learn so much more from other people than you would imagine, uh, especially if you're not a natural and you're trying to navigate yourself into a leadership role. Uh, I think that that is just a really valuable concept. Um, and I like your sports analogy as well. And I think that this does sound like something just that will be invaluable to so many people, you know, completely valuable um, to so many people. Um, so another question I had was uh, while you were putting all of this together, did anything surprise you specifically? Was there anything that kind of came up and you were, you kind of had to sit down and evaluate your original thoughts on it? I think as I've learned about the publishing industry and putting this out, it's surprising there aren't more supporting resources. I was surprised the app that I was creating didn't exist, that no one came up with this before. Things like the development program we mentioned, I haven't seen that with other books. And it's just such a natural extension. Most people, I think authors and what they tell authors is, oh, you have a book. Well, you need to go on podcasts or radio or TV and don't forget your social media and build your email list. And it's all about, hey, everyone, look at me. And you shout that long enough and then hope you get enough eyeballs and that converts to sales. But it's driven by that sales mentality instead of how can I deliver more value, do things that are helpful to the reader. And I think I'm surprised that mindset is not as clear within the whole publishing industry. Yeah, there is a lot of noise, I guess, and I'm not knocking it because I am certainly part of that noise, um, as are a lot of us. Uh, you know, I think it's funny to consider a librarian somebody who makes noise, but I think we kind of have to, uh, you know, just and also kind of getting back to the concept of your book and rethinking things, you know, like when you're when you're moving into a world that's very different. Um, you kind of have to rethink the way that things were done and, you know, sort of take a bit of um, inventory in how things are happening and how that can apply to you. Uh, but that's, that's a good point. I, I really like that. I'll, I'll jump on my soapbox for just a minute. Part of the motivation for the app is, I think, a sea change in how we consume content. Content has always been linear from sitting around the fire and the person tells the story start to finish to the books that go start to finish. In fact, my book, books were meant to be read in order. My book was designed, you can open it up and go right to chapter eight and then to chapter one and then seven and three. You can do it in any order, whatever works for you. Even when we went to movies and TV, still it's a linear format. And in fact, I think we're going to shift to these nonlinear formats that people say, I want this content here and now. In fact, books, a little bit of history about books, books have to be a certain width to show up on the shelf. If your book was only 80 pages, it was too thin, your spine width was too thin. So in the bookstore, you can't see the book from across the room and no one will buy it. And this is why you've probably read a book at some point where you said, interesting book, let's say a nonfiction book, but they really only needed four pages and then they just beat the idea to death for another 120. And that's because they had to make a certain width. We are no longer constrained by that. Obviously eBooks, you can do any length and no one cares about the spine anymore. But even more importantly, I might need this part of the book or this thing at this moment. And so going forward for fiction and I have a, for nonfiction, I have a whole thing about fiction as well we're going to take books and start putting them in these nonlinear formats as my app does. So I think there's a really interesting future for content. The book still has a place and I still prefer physical paper books, but I think there'll be some really interesting innovations with how we consume content in the future. It's great that you say that specifically because um, I know I mentioned it to you briefly before we started recording and you know, just in general, when people ask, 
well, what is the focus of turn the page? And I say, the focus is uh, that we are a library and that we don't want to just provide the same type of content in every single thing that we record. We want people to say, here's turn the page and it has all of these different episodes and maybe this episode won't work for us, but this one is really cool because I want to learn about um, networking and it's not, you know, and leadership, it's not my normal thing, but also I really like thrillers. So I could check this episode out when I'm done with it. It really just like, I like to say cast a wide net uh, because when you're in a library, you wanna make sure that you have something for everybody. And I, I'm thinking about it in that way, you know, you're talking about books being a certain length and beating the same point home. I can't tell you how many um, nonfiction books about this type of um, thing I've read, you know, about just learning different skills where I get to probably about, I don't even want to say 75% through, like 55%. And then I look at the rest of the book and I was just, you know, say, this is the same thing over and over again. Okay, I get it. I don't have time for this. I need to move on. Exactly. So books themselves are evolving. And I think ebooks are going to a shorter format and audio books, but we'll see other innovations as well. It's going to be a very exciting time for content as we get further into the 21st century. So going back to nonlinear before we close out, just because I think that this is all super interesting, just reading stuff about you, do you ballroom dance? I do ballroom dance. I was a competitive ballroom dancer throughout my 20s. I used to go to the national championships every year. And that was a, a wonderful period of my life. So what is competitive ballroom dance like? It is a lot of fun. Ballroom dancing has a wonderful community. Certainly, I think people get the concept of ballroom dancing and that we've all seen Dancing with the Stars these days. With competitive ballroom dancing, you have a standard partner. I often get asked, do you have one partner or is it random? You have a partner. You might have two, maybe if you dance two styles and you choose to have different partners with each. I had one partner for all styles. You go on the floor and the way a typical round works you're on the floor for about 90 seconds dancing. You have, let's say five judges and the judges are just looking across the floor. They're gonna look at you for about two or three seconds. And in that time, they make a binary decision. Should you be recalled to the next round? And if so, they write down your number. If not, they don't and ignore you. And so for 90 seconds, there are a couple judges who are looking at everyone, they're writing down some numbers and that's it. And then they tally how many judges wrote down your number. Everyone gets a score. They bring back roughly half the people. And so round after round, you go half, 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 until you get to, you aim for six people. It could even be seven or eight. And then you do the final round where everyone is ranked one to six or one to seven and tally those scores. But it is a lot of fun. It's a great sport. It's definitely good cardiovascular activity, good for balance, wonderful people, great community. And I recommend people give it a try. Thank you so much. So uh, for those of you who got to the uh, last part of the episode and got to hear about that, you can probably pick up firsthand how nonlinear stuff is actually kind of great because once you've made certain points, uh, you want to move on to something else. Uh, but of course, we have not made all the points in the book and that are available on the app. So um, you absolutely should check it out. And um, if people, once again, want to find out more about you, uh, where can they find you? You can go to my website, thecareertoolkitbook.com. There you can see where to get the book, follow me on social media, or get in touch with me. I have new content. I put out articles each week. There's the app I mentioned. So if you go to the app page, it will take you to the Android and iPhone stores for the free download. And then there's the resources page with those free downloads, including how to upskill your organization, whether it's yours or maybe create a local meetup group or get your library to, to do this, to create that group, to upskill yourself and others. Links to other free resources, all of that is available on my website, thecareertoolkitbook.com. 
And then if you're interested in the general app, if you go to cognoscomedia.com, C-O-G-N-O-S-C-O media.com and look for the brain bump link starting in April, we're going to have that available as a download on the Android and iPhone stores. And that's going to have content from other books and podcasts. And by the way, as an extra bonus on that website, anyone who's thinking of doing a book, I link to about 200 of the most useful resources online for aspiring authors. So everything you want to know about putting a book together, from coming up with covers to finding an agent to how to market a book, that's all linked from the Cognosco Media site as well. Mark, it was a pleasure talking to you. Uh, please come back at some point in the future and we could do a little bit more of a deep dive if that suits you. That would be delightful. Once again, this was Jessica with Syosset Libraries Turn the Page. Our guest today was? Mark Hirschberg. And we are going to close this chapter. It's time to close this chapter of Turn the Page. Join us for the next episode.